Hello, everyone. Welcome. We are so excited to see all of the participants flooding in, and we are very, very grateful that you've chosen to join us today. Hello. Yes, whoever, whoever shared that heart, we want to see more of those throughout the conversation. That is absolutely welcome. Anyone who has reactions that you're feeling as our panelists uh, share more about themselves and their impactful work in each of their parts of the world, we would love for you to celebrate them, uh, to share in the chat what is really resonating with you. And also, if you have any questions, so throughout the conversation, we'll have the opportunity to hear from you as well in terms of what you're curious about and what you'd like to learn more uh, from our panelists. So we're two minutes in and we're gonna give everyone another three minutes to join. Hello again for everyone who's joining us. We are so excited to have you part of this conversation, as part of this conversation. I see 71 participants and growing. This is absolutely amazing. We're so grateful that you're here with us. And if you feel inclined, we'd love to hear where you're joining us from. We are all in so many different parts of the world helping to make this, this, this world and our communities a kinder and braver place through our work, through our impact. And, and we're excited to dive into today's conversation very, very shortly. Perfect. So I'll, I'll get started. And for those folks who join, um, please know that we're, we're excited to have you. Um, and, uh, and if anyone misses anything, we'll work with the United for Global Mental Health team to ensure that you have a recap of today's conversation. 
Hello and good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone who's joining us today. My name is Sharila Stepan. I use she, her pronouns, and I'm so excited for the invitation to chair this conversation and, and this meeting with all of you today. I am also very excited to kick off our time together by sharing about an organization that is close to my heart, Born This Way Foundation. Co-founded in 2012 by Lady Gaga and her mother, Cynthia Germanata, our foundation is committed to the wellness of young people and empowering them, supporting them, and working with them to build a kinder and braver world. I'll admit, when I say working with them, I think I'm thinking of all of you, working with you and together in creating this kinder and braver world. And center, central to our mission is the belief that kindness is not just a virtue, but a powerful tool for positive change. And at Born This Way Foundation, we strive every day to validate the emotions of young people everywhere. And we work tirelessly to eliminate the stigma that surrounds mental health. And we're, we're also very strongly about that word, eliminate versus reduce. We're hoping to ensure that everyone in the world has someone to turn to. And our aim is to do that by fostering healthy conversations about mental health, connecting young people with the resources and services to build communities that prioritize good mental health. And what truly, what I believe, uh, it's at Born This Way Foundation apart, similar to the many organizations that you'll hear from today, is our commitment to involving young people in every aspect of our work. We firmly believe that every young person has something unique to contribute, and with the right opportunities, resources, and platforms, they can bring that positive change into the world. Our Youth Advisory Board embodies this belief, and I've had the privilege of serving on Born This Way Foundation's Advisory Board when I was just a 19-year-old college student. I can personally attest to the transformative power of this experience, the experience of being actively included in conversations and decisions that help shape the mission and vision of an organization that does this impactful type of work. I was just 19 years old, and it was during this time that I was exposed to a world of new ideas and perspectives in the public sector, which I never thought were possible or had ever encountered before. And similar to many of the folks who are who you'll hear from today, um, being part of this organization has shown me what my impact in this world uh, can, can do and how I can purposefully uh, invite others into this space with me to create this kinder and braver world that we envision. And for our current advisory board members, we work with them regularly through virtual and in-person meetings with our programs and research and communications team to share their insights and guide the direction of our work. As a result, they also acquire leadership skills and gain experience through many aspects, including storytelling and advocacy for change to, to enact positive change in their corners of the world. And they also have the privilege of connecting with like-minded individuals, knowing that we're right now over 80 folks on this call, including our panelists, really extending who we are with each other and what we do in this world as, a, as an additional space for us to collaborate and to hear from each other and to improve upon ideas. That is the core of what we're here to do today. And as we continue to strive for a kinder and braver world, we understand um, first and foremost, <clears throat> at least at Born This Way Foundation, that it begins with equipping younger, gen younger generations with the skills and confidence to better support each other and themselves in the process. And so the objectives of this webinar are to highlight the youth leaders driving change in the, in the mental health sector, inspire young people, those of you who have joined us and those who will watch shortly after, um, to work in the mental health space to gain strategies, who work, excuse me, in the mental health space to gain strategies and suggestions on how to continue your work and engage with other audiences, to present youth experts, to actively consult and engage in the mental health sector, and for funders and organizations and activists to recognize youth-led organizations working successfully in the mental health sector. And, and so I'm now um, full with pride and privilege and excitement to hand it over to our panelists who are leading this work firsthand in each of their respective communities. And we'll kick it off with Chelsea, who will then pass it off to another panelist. Chelsea. 
thank you very, very much. And good morning to, well, good morning, good evening, good night to everyone. Um, thank you all for joining us. Uh, my name is Chelsea Jordan, and I'm a 24-year-old student um, pursuing um, a Bachelor of Science in Environmental Science and Ecology. Um, I'm the current Vice President at Let's Unpack It, which is a youth-led, youth-focused mental health advocacy organization um, here in Barbados. Um, and we have um, partners across the um, Caribbean region. Um, I'm excited to be here. I'm really um, happy to be able to share what Let's Unpack It is about and how we inspire that change in young people and um, being leaders in this space, um, being recognized as experts, as persons that we can, that, that we can, that can you know, give the advice and, and in, in not this change in policies and really help to move forward the um, conversations surrounding mental health. So it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I'll hand over to Viet. Thank you, Chelsea. I think like we're already having uh, like this like telepathy because I was gonna say I'm also 24. So I think we could be like that 24 twinsies here. But um, hello, hello everyone, uh, wherever you are um, uh, on this earth. Um, my name is Viet. I use he, him, his pronouns. Um, currently, I'm serving as the director of programs from Light Health Social Enterprise. So what we are is that we are um, an LGBTQI plus led um, civil society like organization in Vietnam. We have been running since 2004. Uh, we, we deeply focus on uh, health equity um, and advocacy, you know, for LGBTQI plus youth and young key populations, um, you know, especially those who are most vulnerable and impacted by HIV and AIDS. Uh, we have a like a very large uh, mental health uh, program and portfolio. Um, actually, in, in 2022, last year, uh, we found it and we organized the first LGBTQI plus mental health uh, forum in Vietnam. And uh, I'm very privileged, you know, to be the current chair of the LGBTQI plus mental health network in Vietnam. So uh, I hope that today uh, we're going to have some really fruitful conversations on youth leadership. I know that this panel um, is filled and occupied with a lot of um, inspiring youth leaders. So I hope to, you know, to delve deeper into those conversations with all of you, including the people in, in the chat as well. So please do tune in. I'm going to pass it on to uh, Pien. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Gian. Uh, I'm based in Jakarta, Indonesia. I represent my nonprofit foundation, Emancipate Indonesia. So uniquely, we don't focus on mental health per se, but uh, we are focused on fighting for young working class rights. And because we, when we are too overworked and underpaid, there's no mental health. So, And we have great interest in, in that uh, part. Uh, in the past, I've also been working on several initiatives and movements as well, uh, including a, a peer education program for two years in a small city where I taught um, these uh, young leaders as well, a module on NCDs prevention, non-communicable disease, but also including mental health in an intersectional uh, lens. Recently, I've also been um, very much um, privileged to join a Being Initiative, uh, initiative basically uh, to learn and also to basically invest and mobilize uh, uh, to su support regarding young people's mental health in low middle income countries, including my country, Indonesia. Uh, there, um, I acted as the uh, council member to also uh, ensure that this initiative will be intersectional and we also put uh, youth leadership above uh, everything else as well in the initiative. So very much humbled to be here and looking forward to exchange stories and uh, best practices here. I'm gonna give it to Hawa. Thank you. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Hawa Ojefo. I'm the founder and executive director at She Writes Women Mental Health Initiative. And we're a movement that gives mental health a voice in Nigeria by empowering people who actually live with mental health conditions or psychosocial disabilities to tell their own stories, co create the solutions, and advocate for their rights. We do that across advocacy and Safe Place Nigeria, which is a support arm of the organization where we run 24-7 toll-free helpline, free and unlimited teletherapy, and also disseminate accurate um, information um, about mental health. Through our advocacy, we are ensuring that we're leaving the mantra of nothing without us, by ensuring that we're empowering and building the capacity of people with uh, mental health conditions, as like social disabilities, to be able to carry out meaningful participation and sit on decision-making tables um, about them. So yeah, I'm so excited to be here to share what our leadership has looked like here in Nigeria. 
I will pass it over to Ashley. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, everyone. My name is Ashley Lashley. I'm like Chelsea. I'm from Barbados. It's a pleasure to be here within this panel discussion today. And just a bit background about myself. Um, I'm currently UNICEF Youth Advocate for the Eastern Caribbean, as well as CARICOM Youth Ambassador for Barbados. And like everyone here, I have a love and passion for youth engagement, but that of meaningful youth engagement predominantly on social issues as it relates to health, the environment, and by extension, climate change and human rights. So that's just a brief background about me because I know we'll be delving a bit more into the work that we're currently doing within our related spaces. So I'm wishing, hoping everyone have a fantastic um, discussion and enjoy the conversations in which we will be bringing to you guys today about mental health and the work that we're doing. So I'll hand back over to um, the host of today. Thank you so much, Ashley. Thank you all for sharing a bit about yourselves and your work. And I'd love to go back to you, Hawa. In January 2023, previous Nigerian president, Mahamadou Buhari, signed into law the Nigerian bill as a significant milestone for mental health in the country. Can you please share what leadership looked like for you during your advocacy up to that moment? And what was your role in, uh, as, a, as a youth leader in ensuring that the bill is, uh, is a reality for young people in Nigeria? Yeah, sure. Thank you so much. Amazing question. So, um, yes, indeed, the bill was passed into law in January, which is a step in the right direction. I would say categorically that it's not the best of bills when it comes to, you know, uh, ensuring and protecting the rights of people with mental health conditions, protecting their liberty, which I think is something that resonates with a lot of us in the mental health space. However, uh, what leadership looks for us, and this was leadership that started in 2018, so it was really like a five-year journey to actually getting the bill um, into law, or at least ensuring that we could have some participation, which is something that I definitely want to double down on. Um, I think one of the things that is so important in such a situation and what we have seen in our experience is that for many years in trying to pass a mental health law in Nigeria, there hadn't been proper youth representation. And beyond that, or even deeper than that, it's that there hadn't been the representation of people with mental health conditions and psychosocial disabilities. And so it was so important that for us, it was a priority. It was about, it wasn't just about, okay, let's get a law passed. It was about, we want to be at the table when these conversations are being had. And so a lot of movement building, a lot of community mobilization, and a lot of allyship, ally building as well. So looking at intersections within, um, you know, when it comes to mental health, we're looking at human rights, we're looking at disability, we're looking at, you know, international development organizations as well. We're looking at other social issues. We're looking at women's rights issues as well, uh, because we do know about the burden of mental health disproportionately on women and how, you know, lifting that is significantly with the global burden of mental health. And so it's looking at all of these intersections, but also realizing that when we're trying to get youth involved in things, we have to speak the youth language as well. One of the things that I think, um, especially on the African continent, where we have very old leaders, uh, in terms of age, is that we feel like young people do not read between the lines, we don't read the fine print, um, we don't particularly, we're not particularly interested. So whilst we say, oh, we want things, when the paper comes out, we're just like, oh, yeah, yeah, it's been done. But one thing we definitely wanted to do for ourselves is to ensure that we are, we're reading the fine print and we're able to question and interrogate every single aspect of what the bill looked like. And so in building those intersections and also leveraging international and local partnerships um, from the lots of Human Rights Watch to Disability Rights Fund to the World Health Organization, really and truly building it up and building momentum just so that there is some level of validity in the movement as well. Um, and just ensuring that we're also using issues around um, the lived experience of people with mental health conditions, photojournalism, films, um, using depicting through multimedia what abuses look like and why certain things were non-negotiable for us in ensuring that the bill was right to respect him. So, for example, showing the, the chaining and shackling of people with mental health conditions in traditional healing facilities, showing that even state-owned facilities and, you know, certain abuses that happen even in psychiatry as well, and how, you know, there is a lack of community service or community-based services and things like that. Just showing that could actually be more appealing 
and could also raise a lot more awareness. The usage of social media was definitely something that was very important to us as well. How do we use social media to begin to drive these conversations? Not in just, you know, declaring what are the facts and figures and all of it, but actually using storytelling, putting the people who have the lived experience at the forefront of it. So that was definitely our role in like ensuring, and all of that really was culminated into being at the table. We want to be at the table because we can give you demands and you go into your doors and you can do whatever you want. But we want to be in the room when conversations that affect us are being had. Yes, 100%. Thank you so much. I am uh, all for all the points that you shared. I think at its core is really authentically incorporating young people with lived experiences into the spaces where the decisions are being made. Thank you. And, and we know that as you shared, that's a challenge. That's a challenge everywhere in a lot of parts of the world. And when I think, uh, Viet, when I think of your work um, at Lighthouse International in advocating for mental health of young people, uh, of LGBTQ, um, TI, LGBTI, excuse me, plus young people, um, and those affected uh, uh, by HIV in Vietnam, I think about how the barriers for inclusion might be quite uh, extensive. And I'd love to hear from you and, and if you're willing to share with us what, what the leadership strategy of Lighthouse is to ensure that um, your work continues to be youth-led and prioritizes the mental health of young people at every level. I think um, so much insight that you can provide into the levels of that work would be really helpful. Yeah, totally. I think, um, you know, again, really resonating with the challenges that, uh, you know, like how I just mentioned, uh, especially when, you know, for us Lighthouse, we're really like addressing the, the equities when it comes to mental health for, you know, young key populations and LGBTQ plus youth. Um, these are, are really um, as people would, would, you know, would call them like hard to reach populations, not because that uh, these populations are, are, are not willing to kind of like reach out for help, but it's more on the oppressive systems that really sort of like shield these people away from, you know, like the um, social support that they could get. So um, as we understand that they're kind of like there are a lot of different oppressive systems that stack one another, you know, like for these individuals, we had to incorporate, you know, like more uh, innovative and in more sort of like engaging ways, you know, to to, to really include them in, um, you know, our um, mechanisms of, um, you know, like decision making. So one of which, um, you know, our leadership strategies that uh, really centers, um, you know, uh, youth mental health is that um, for different projects, we would always use like this, you know, like like unison uh, approach where we would have um, a community um, advisory board uh, for each project slash program. And often uh, we would really want to, you know, go above and beyond and in, in including um, youth with lived experience of mental health, um, you know, with like different projects. Um, that's the like the way that we have demonstrated, you know, our vision, you know, for shared governance with these youth, um, you know, through through such, you know, um, like community uh, like advisory boards, um, they could find themselves, you know, like among different peers who who uh, they could kind of like collaborate with, get inspired by, and also bounce, um, you know, like creative um, ideas of one another, and um, you know, with like this board, um, it kind of like forms like a little community, you know, for you as experts. And then you could kind of like go back to your own sub communities because we do understand that even under like the brick umbrella of young key populations um, and, and, and even LGBTQ plus youth, that's like really huge umbrellas. And there are many like different um, sub marginalized groups. So we do understand that each person on that board needs to kind of like go back to their own sub uh, community liaise, you know, like their um, like opinions and 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 what their community wants and like deliver that in our mechanism of um, you know co making decisions, and um, oftentimes we we do see that community advisory board as an opportunity you know to, to kind of like weed out um, any unintentional you know way of making decisions in a very monolithic. Um, you know, way. Because like oftentimes when we're like including youth in a lot of ways, it it just becomes very like like tokenistic. Like you're using, you know, one person who represents like this group and like the other person and and you know it just kind of like loves everyone like experiences and you know diversity and hardship together when in fact um you know like like nothing like that translates into you know like reality. So uh having like this um 
board of, of, of you know, just like diverse youth with lived experiences. I think that uh, like it really hones in that that importance of, um, you know, intersectionality. And my second point, um, when it comes to our um, like leadership strategy uh, for centering, you know, like youth mental health, uh, um, you know, is that we we really um, engage, you know, youth, uh, especially youth leaders, um, wherever like wherever possible and, and wherever they find fit and desire to. Um, more often than not, I, I feel like uh, like a lot of the times youth are included in, in projects and, and, and initiatives in, in ways that are so traditional. Uh, and like some of the only ways that they could be included in, in is, you know, it's just like those like very initial like consultation for project design or program design. But with our approach, you know, we could hire uh, consultants who are youth, um, you know, like LGBTQI plus youth with lived experiences of, of mental health. We uh, have them as a consultants that really uh, coordinate and and, and be a part of the project from start to finish, uh, from design, you know, all the way to m and &E. And um, we kind of like use like different tactics as, as well. And also, you know, in terms of um, kind of like, also like centering, you know, like youth mental health, it's it's another way of, of, of you having at the back of your mind where I could find, you know, an area for intersectionality between youth mental health and other human rights, um, you know, movements. And in in our experiences, um, you know, that have only done us like so good. Uh, not not only through you know like complementary um, funding, but it's also the political momentum that both of these or or multiple movements could could share with another, like 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 one another, and then they could really like like reverberate because you know in our experience um, advocating you know to ministry of health you know for the gender of affirmation law that deals with youth mental health as well because one of the criteria for for, for people to you know uh, have their gender affirmed and recognized by the government is is, is like um um, assessment of psychiatric conditions and then through like HIV and AIDS as well there's like a lot of needs from from um, you know populations who are most vulnerable by uh, HIV um, which are you know men who have sex with men and, and, and transgender women and and they always lie in that intersection of HIV and AIDS which is a like a huge physical health need and also mental health so um, that those are some of the ways that we uh, as lighthouse as youth youth leaders um, have made decisions you know to, to really hone in and, and um, diversify and um, you know incorporate youth mental health thank you thank you so much for that insight I, I I'm sure that with with what you've shared we're only scratching the surface uh, of what um, of what the power of incorporating youth voices and and to your point, hiring young people as consultants, really valuing their time, uh, our time, and uh, participation in in supporting a lot of these initiatives is incredibly important. And um and I'm I'm very curious, uh, Ashley, about your work at UNICEF as a youth advocate and also as the founder of your own organization which focuses, uh, similar to what Viet was saying, on prioritizing youth well-being through a child and youth-centered approach. Only your work uh, focuses on the Caribbean. Um, I, I'm curious on why you've chosen that model uh, that centers uh, on child and youth-led climate change in, in the Caribbean and how this is being received. Um, we've heard from our panelists on what it looks like for us to drive that change forward and to advocate for youth inclusion. And I'm curious on what you're seeing on the other end. What, what does it look like um, uh, implemented uh, under your specific cause and how is it being received? How can other leaders join that movement? Yeah, definitely. Um, so to answer your first question, I mean, like the others, we know that uh, inclusion is very important when it comes to advocating for the rights of our children and our young people. So just taking you a step back as to like why I exactly chose children and youth as like that focus to advocate on and how it's tied to UNICEF, it actually began on non-communicable diseases at home. I remember I was a student and Every day at school, me and my friends were often buying a lots of unhealthy uh, meals. And I couldn't understand why there were no like healthy food options for us to purchase or why our behaviors were more going towards the unhealthy purchasing of foods. Um, so there and then um, I did a bit of research within it. And I realized that there's lots of young persons at home and across the Caribbean region 
who are living with a form of non-communicable diseases. And that led me to establish the Schools Against Non-Communicable Diseases, which looked at sensitizing our students at home about the importance of maintaining a healthy lifestyle. And through that uh, movement, I remember I started the first Global Youth Network Summit, which brought together students from across the Caribbean region and internationally as well to discuss the Sustainable Development Goals Non-Communicable Diseases. And there then I extended an invitation to the representative at the time of UNICEF to come out and participate and deliver key remarks. So there, and then I know uh, my colleague, he spoke about uh, token, tokenism. And what I realized as a young person growing up, certain young persons within our spaces were often like handpicked based on their political uh, political affiliations. And there are lots of young persons within those marginalized and stigmatized communities at home and those remote areas across the Caribbean region that weren't really meaningfully engaged within the social conversations that our leaders um, were having. So establishing that global um, youth summit looked at ensuring that our young persons who were not like handpick our children and by our political leaders were included into the spaces to have conversations as it relates to how best they uh, think that they should be included and what more needs to be done on the topic of the sustainable development goals and non-communicable diseases at the time. As a young person coming from Barbados, a small island developing state, uh, we only control contribute 1% to the total greenhouse gas emissions. And I remember a time I was watching TV with my dad and I realized that the, and we recognized that the former United States president pulled out of the Paris Agreement. And coming from a small island developing state like Barbados, well, we're experiencing firsthand the dramatic changes to our overall environment. So I wanted to take action. And there and then I established a movement in collaboration with UNICEF. This was before I became a youth advocate that is entitled the Hay Campaign. And Hay stands for healthy and environmentally friendly youth. And what the Hay Campaign looks at is building bridges between the youth from the Caribbean and connecting them to young persons from across the world. So I remember when I first started the network, I had uh, approximately 21 young persons and we were building their capacity to advocate for climate and health justice. So we had young persons from the Caribbean and different young persons from across the world. And we know when it comes to youth engagement, those providing young persons with networking opportunities is one of the main, is one of the key ways as well in which they can grow and develop in their overall journeys as young persons connecting to different young persons. And only last year, we're now celebrating three years of the Hay campaign. And funny enough, I remember through the Hay movement, is where I really recognize that climate change does have an impact on people's, not only their physical health, but their mental health. And why I said that is because I remember through our Global Youth Network Summit, again, um, it was coming into our third or fourth year, and one of our Hay ambassadors from Dominica, she alluded to the fact that after Hurricane Maria dis devastated her country, that it had an impact on her and her family's uh, mental health and the recovery element and the psychosocial support that is needed for persons after a natural disaster occurs, that is very important. And that was lacking within some of the uh, countries across the Caribbean and by extension the world as well, because now we all, within our healthcare sectors, we don't really look at the psychosocial support in depth after a natural disaster. And that really propelled uh, me into re recognizing the impact, but going, going to beyond the psychosocial support and the inclusion and what my peers would have mentioned as it relates to inclusion and tokenism, what we recognize through the hate campaign too is that lots of young persons globally have uh, innovative ideas and they go way beyond the capacity building element and yes. we recognize that lots of persons have give young persons support on capacity building and building their knowledge but they just need a bit as go a step further and that step further is that of financial support and the financial resources that they need in order to propel their movements and their ideas um, forward and through the hey campaign movement we are calling we continue to provide financial support 
support any form of grant funding to young persons on their ideas on climate and health, climate entrepreneurship. Um, so that's just some of the work in which we're doing and um, how young persons can join. Normally our campaign is a yearly process. So within January or February of 2024, and we would then be releasing a call um, for um, young persons to join um, the movement. So I hope I touch on your you. elements. I know that time is short. So thanks again. Thank you. No, thank you so much. We're, we're really grateful for, for that insight and, and also for the tangible ways in which we can build bridges and uh, underscore the consorted effort needed to make an impact and what that looks like for your organization. Thank you so much, Ashley. And, um, and Chelsea, you're part of Let's Unpack It. Um, and, and really, I just, I'm, I'm very excited to, to, with the perspective that Ashley just provided, really dive into uh, the motto of your organization, listen, unite, and inspire. I think those really embody uh, what it means to build bridges and, um, and, and the consorted effort that's needed to make this impact. And so what does this motto mean for you, uh, for youth mental health advocates um, whose work is driving mental health change globally uh, from grassroots to bigger organizations? Thank you so much for that question. Yes, what you have what you have highlighted um, is our motto, um, but we also like to consider these our three tenants. Um, so when we go back to our founding story, um, for us at Let's Unpack It, we realized that you know mental health didn't really appear to be a priority um, for Caribbean governments, right? Um, so we chose to stand, you know, in between that breach between youth and policymakers, um, and there we realized that. We really are truly stakeholders in this fight, right? They fight for proper equitable resources and laws and, you know, to help to protect and serve the young people and their mental health. Um, and what we also realize is that in the development and um, of policy and global action, um, there is a need for young people, as we've all said um, in our contributions. And, you know, as our president, David, always says, you know, there's nothing for us without us, right? So in the spirit of empathy and respect, um, we knew that we had to be open to listening, um, listening to the key concerns and issues from young people, and also taking note of the things that they want to be heard by others, right? Um, we also knew that we had to create that safe space for young people and really begin to normalize conversations surrounding mental health, you know, normalizing empathy, vulnerability, having these open discussions and normalizing that it's okay to speak up. And, and really share how we're feeling, right? Then we realized that in order to, you know, make a, truly make a mark in this fight, we had to unite. Uh, not only unite to dismantle the stigma and the misconceptions surrounding mental health, but there was also a greater need to unite and pull from all corners of society as we're all sitting here from different sectors, you know, really understanding the interconnectivity of mental health and physical health, agriculture, climate change, you know, all of these sectors must work together in this fight. And we also saw that we had to unite on areas of bridging those generational gaps. In the Caribbean, this is possibly one of our largest problems that we face um, in getting the conversation going. You know, there's a stigma attached to any psychiatric hospital or institution. Um, they talk about even going to a therapist or even the mere existence of there being a possibility of something being, you know, not well mentally. Um, there's also this misconception about strength and vulnerability and what these things are. And we realize that these things truly lie along generational lines and, you know, compounded with not airing your dirty laundry, it really adds to the issue, right? So we understand and we saw the importance of being the bridge um, and, you know, bring together everyone um, to get this common mental health literacy, this common goal, this common fight, really to stimulate um, some of these needed conversations. But then we also understood that everyone must play their role, you know, from the everyday citizen to the policymaker, you know, we truly had to stand in that gap between young people and the policymakers. So as a youth led and youth centered organization, we realized the importance of uniting young people and bringing their concerns to the people that can actually have um, made that, that um, change happen. And I think this is where we truly understood what, multi, what a multi-sectoral approach was and a whole of society approach, right? So then that kind of brings me to my third tenant. And we all know that when it comes to mobilizing people, inspiration is a major way to do that. You know, so being inspired, um, you know, kind of ensures that mental wellness is prioritized and that the conversations are being had. You know, it also means that one is willing to be a part 
of the action and to make mental health a lived reality for all. So we wanted to inspire others to take action and prioritize their own mental health and wellness. We wanted to inspire national conversations and policy change. And as it relates to our vision, you know, we want to inspire nations and the region and the world to ensure that everyone can feel empowered to attain that, high, that highest um, attainable standard of health and wellness. And that includes mental health. That is a fundamental right, you know? Um, so we really wanted to encourage young people, you know, take up the baton, become advocates for themselves and also demand that action, you know? So I'd say that the three main things I've learned on this journey so far um, is that young people want to be heard. You know, we want to be included in meaningful engagement and we have, we have all mentioned that so far and we also want access to proper resources and you know we have the solutions you know we just need that platform and the listening ear and we want to have those frank and open conversations um about the things that are lacking and you know in hopes to garner that support you know from those who have the greater capacity you know to really bring about those policy changes and you know there's an infamous saying you know many hands make like work and we understand that we really need that, you know, for um, other entities and the solidarity. Um, some of my um, other panelists would have mentioned about lived experiences, so I wouldn't really go into that. Um, but I really want to say to um, my fellow mental health advocates that, you know, no matter um, if you're at the grassroots level or a larger organization, I implore you to never forget your way and who you represent. Um, this fight is not only for ourselves, you know, but it's for all youth. And we need to be better, you know, we, we, we need better and we will fight for better, um, but we must never really forget our mission, right? So, you know, I really implore us um, here to, you know, commit to similar actions that truly recognize young people as key stakeholders um, and really partners in the national and global mental health action and to really take steps to hear out their concerns. Um, as was mentioned before as well, you know, including from planning to implementation of these strategies. Yeah, go ahead. If I, if I may, I, I, I would love to, that piece that you shared, um, I, I'd love to use that as the, the, the opportunity to, um, uh, to shift to Gian's work and, and really underscore what you've just shared. I think it's true for all of us, uh, that piece on um, many hands make light work. Um, the work that we're doing is tough. We are all advocates working on very tough issues, as you've described, and I, I'm, I'm very curious in seeing how it plays out. And, and also remind folks that are joining us today to please share in the comment section uh, any questions that you have. We're after uh, Gian um, uh, shares his thoughts. We're about uh, to enter the portion where we'll have a discussion with you all. And so please, please, please share your questions. Uh, in the chat. And thank you again, Chelsea, for that insightful overview. And again, I, I, I'd love to turn it to you and um, really zero in on your organization, Emancipate Indonesia, um, an organization uh, aiming to end modern day slavery. You speak a lot about the intersectionality of mental health and how you keep this mind in leading your organization, this in mind. And uh, I'm curious on your, uh, what, what those areas of intersectionality are and what you would say to another young leader, an advocate looking to integrate mental health into their programs and advocacy. Uh, and, and then of course, um, with that, with, with the, the mindset that we're, we're shifting quickly to the next piece, but thank you again. And, and Gian, we're excited to hear your thoughts. Um, thank you, Shadir, and thank you everyone. So I'll just be quick because I know we don't have much time. I would like to have more question and answers, but I think, um, thank you for bringing the intersectionality up. I think the previous speakers has already delivered as well regarding intersectionality, but I think just to make it quick. So my perspective connecting between social determinants in health, such as um, working class uh, welfare, social protection, and in, in regards to mental health, actually comes from my own experience uh, because I think it's a safe space so we can share. So I think from 2018 to 2020, I was working on a grassroots level work uh, actually um, as a project coordinator uh, for a program actually promoting healthy lifestyles. And one of the modules was about mental health. And so I was a young worker, young professional working with uh, adolescent and children basically, uh, middle, middle schoolers, high schoolers, and also working with government and also local leaders like community, religious leaders, et cetera, in order for to make an enabling environment to support their health, including their mental health. 
one of the challenges actually was not working with the young people and adolescents because they were all amazing and we're just uh, learning so much from the community that there is no one size fits all and everything. But the challenge was actually coming from me as a worker in that sector. So I have to be ready and all out for them every day on the field and scorching heat and everything and then dealing with all the <laughs> basically ageism and, and sexism and everything, basically like all kinds of discrimination uh, that we are facing with all multiple kinds of people on, on a daily basis. But then when I got back home and then I realized where's the mental health for the mental health uh, workers, so, so called, so called, you know, where's the care for the care workers in a way that I had my issue as well. And I, I only got my um, bravery to go counseling basically in recent years, only in 2021. It's that recent actually. And I've been like fighting and, and speaking up for mental health, but I was like secretly, I still had like problems as well regarding my past as well, personally. And then on the top of that, I gained like 10 kilos and I stress eat and everything. And I had problems with my own mental health. So that's when I realized, oh my God, like working conditions, like when you're overworked, you're underpaid, you're underappreciated. And in the face of donors, in the face of implementers, I think also Viet mentioned, right, about the existing ecosystem, is it um, supportive enough? So that's when I realized that actually it is uh, connected. The intersectionality is real when you have actually lived experience through it, especially when you're working for mental health, but you don't have mental health yourself. And what is it for? Like, what's 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 good in it? So that's why, why when I initiated my um, foundation, Mensip Indonesia, we try to incorporate it. For example, we advocate for uh, workers' rights for gig workers, right? The work, basically informal workers who don't have social protections and basic rights as workers. And in Indonesia, even they overwork until the point that they died. You can see it on the news. And not only they died, some of them also got trapped in debts because they, they cannot make ends meet. And some of them, I'm sorry if it's triggering, some of them uh, committed suicide as well. So this is the issues that, this is very concerning when your basic rights is not fulfilled, you're thinking about your family, you have to bring back some income for your family and you can't do it. And then you trap in debts in the face of these big tech companies making billions of dollars and their workers paid like table scraps. So that's when I really had a passion to actually like, this is really connected. So that's where my realization came in. And also I look back to my, my friends in the movement and in the, in the foundation, and I see that many activists as well, uh, including myself in the past, don't really care about our own ways of trying to cope with it, right? Because for example, I also advocate for tobacco control, smoking, right? Again, smoking. And I realize I, I, my enemies is not smoking. It's, it's, not, it's not smokers, but they smoke because they try to cope with uh, things uh, happening in their life, including their mental health issues. So that's also added some perspective in, within me. And I try to advocate that as well within the people in that uh, health perspective. And also I co-created the protocol as well, as well as guiding documents on how we can mitigate risk, including mental health as well for our own, because before you go out to the world, advocate for bigger things, before we push for better policies for mental health, I think we also need to take care of each or our own before we, uh, we really need to make sure our own mental health as social workers, mental health professional people and young people, young leaders in mental health. Uh, this is why I'm very, very much um, uh, actually uh, privileged to join Being Initiative as well. In Being Initiative, we have, uh, it's actually an initiative to learn, invest and mobilize uh, uh, um, mental health support for young people in low middle income countries. And we have two kinds of advisory boards. One is youth advisory board. And second is people with lived experience, uh, experience uh, advisory boards, because as mentioned previously as well, lived experience should count as expertise. You don't have to get a PhD public health degree from John Hopkins in order to speak about this kind of issues. When you have leaks experience, just like me, a, a struggling, um, uh, basically freelance worker in the development sector, you also have a stay in as really if you have a leak experience yes. in mental health. So we need to rethink our expertise and we need to rethink what this intersectionality means and what does it look like in the practice. I'm sorry, I take too much time and back to you today. <laughs> no, no, there's there's no need to apologize. I, I am so deeply and in, really involved in what each of you has shared. And I think that from the nods and from the comment section, we're, we're really seeing that these words are resonating. So thank you for that. I think what you shared about caring for ourselves as advocates is incredibly important. The intersectionality of the work and really ensuring that 
many voices within the space are being heard in all aspects and that we're having active conversations that lead to improvements in systems um, to avoid uh, some of the, the challenges that you've shared are incredibly important. And then I also want to share um, with everyone a, a quick, um, I just dropped a link. If anyone is feeling that they need any type of support based on what they're, they're uh, hearing um, being shared, if it feels too heavy or if you need additional support, there's a helpline I just uh, shared. There are also many resources at bornthisway.foundation. And for any reason, you're looking for um, ways to sort of um, uh, really interpret what, what you've just um, uh, navigate the emotions of what you've just heard. And I'd love to jump in uh, to the audience Q&A. Um, as I shared, this, is, uh, this has been such an interesting conversation. We're going just a little bit over time and we may need five minutes on the other end. And so feel free to drop if you've got somewhere to go. We completely understand. Um, but if you'll please join us, I'd love to dive into uh, some questions. Um, I'll pick just two, and I'd love for two of you to jump in and, and share your thoughts so as so much as you feel inclined, um, and to keep your responses as brief as possible. And so with that, I'd love to, to dive into the first question. Um, that's what's the biggest challenges uh, challenge in youth-led mental health advocacy, especially in Black communities? And I, I would love to um, really emphasize Black communities and also expand that. Um, Viet, I'd love to hear from you um, in terms of LGBTQ plus communities um, with discriminatory laws and norms that affect young people or uh, um, uh, deny young people the opportunity from participating in X uh, initiatives. Um, and and uh, please, anyone who feels inclined to comment on Black communities or LGBTQ plus communities, can you please feel free to unmute yourself. So I think I'll just say a little bit and hopefully give a chance for somebody else to also say, I think Chelsea was going to jump in. Um, one thing I'll definitely say is funding. Um, I would say that a lot of money is not going to the kinds of projects that we envision. They're so fancy, they're multi-layered, uh, the problems that we're trying to solve are quite complex. And so it's very, it, it's a step in the right direction to have these conversations, but we need to take it even further by putting money where we, you know, talk about these kinds of things. And it's, it's just so important, especially with the black communities. The second thing I want to just point out is that we need culturally sensitive interventions as opposed to, you know, adopting certain kinds of interventions that work in certain other places and bringing them into black communities or even localized communities, wherever that is, you know, restorative type of, you know, therapies and self-care and what is uh, perhaps even, you know, what, what is worked in other sectors or what is, you know, really what is culturally sensitive, you know, when it comes to dealing with, you know, black people or black communities, African communities as well. So I will just touch on funding and also culturally uh, sensitive interventions. Um, Chelsea, I didn't know what you wanted to jump in. Yeah, I'll just add one point here because obviously in Barbados we're predominantly black, so we don't really have those discriminatory laws um, that you would find other places, but something for us in Barbados um, is resources. Um, whether that is free, equitable resources, um, obviously nobody should have to decide, well, can I eat today or should I go to therapy, right? So that is one of the biggest challenges that we see in Barbados. And then if I can go to a public um, area, then the stigma that's attached. So I don't want anybody to see me walking in there. I don't want anybody to talk about me. So having those resources where you feel comfortable to go, um, they're affordable and you get the same type of um, access and help that um, you would get um, any other place. So I would say that resources and actually um, being able to afford and attain those resources um, is one thing that comes up um, for Caribbean youth a lot. Thank you both so much. Yeah. Yeah, I, I just want to chime in like one thing real quick. Um, you know, as a like a youth leaders um, who's advocating for LGBTQ plus mental in the context of Vietnam, um, I found immense you know challenge when it comes to you know sort of overcoming like the uh, like the police like profiling and like the scrutiny from the police and the government itself on you know like civil society you know as us um, advocating for LGBTQ plus. Uh, youth people, especially when, um, you know, right now it's literally like the, like the time frame when the government is considering the gender affirmation law. So most of the time when there's a lot of like political momentum that leads, um, you know, to, to social changes, there are going to be a lot of, you know, like police profiling, uh, like knocking up on your 
their doors and like uh, asking stuff like that, uh, which you know could 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 really intervene and you know like like interrupt some of your um, like daily stuff. Um, and you know like again like at the end of the day like I I've definitely found that as something that's been you know like a big problem that I have um, have to kind of like maneuver. But luckily, you know falling back to you know like the resources and the support of the uh, mentors that I have uh, who have, um, you know, really gone through like these waves of, of, of activism. Um, I think I've been able to kind of like maneuver that real well. Thank you so much. Thank you. That's that's um, incredibly insightful. And I think uh, one last question, and I'd love to hear Ashley or Gian's thoughts. Uh, the, the question is centered around um, what your opinions are on the best ways to harness partnerships with mental health organizations around the world. And I'd love to uh, really focus that question. Um, I'd love to hear from each of you on what you find to be the most essential element of a partnership that someone wants to have with, for example, your organizations. What, what is something you look for in a partnership, for example? Um, and, and of course, uh, given the time, um, we appreciate your brief responses. Ashley, would you like to kick us off? Yeah, certainly. I think for me, one thing that I look, look in when it comes to farming relationships is to ensure that both parties have resources that can be shared. And because we deal with young persons on a daily basis, we also look at your opportunities that can be shared to young persons in which they can be benefit from, whether it is financial resources or uh, those capacity building um, elements. Um, and also one thing too, I realized that a lot of like persons in which we are partnering going forward look, look at is that level of engaging our audience on our social media um, platforms yeah. as, yeah. So I'll stop there. Thank you. No, no, that I I, uh, I really want to emphasize, underscore that social media element and that engagement is is meeting. That means meeting young people where they're at, and it really yeah. I, I want to uplift that. Thank you. Thank you You're so welcome. much. Yeah. Yeah. Um. I think uh, uh I would love to work with those who have a no one size fits all approach. Really emphasizes on context, basically, because sometimes some funding, some funders just like, we want you to do this and based on this, not even, you know, giving us the space to, you know, reinvent method methodologies and also involve local communities. And most of the people got paid and hired basically are based in global North countries, basically. So those practices are just like, it's an elephant in the room. So I'm just hoping that more decentralization, more fair compensation and no one size fits all. Maybe it's just for me. Thank you. Thank you so much. And so we're, we're beginning to wrap up um, and I'd love to invite uh, everyone uh, to join our panelists. I'm going to ask them for a lightning round uh, by ending the, the or excuse me, by finishing the, the phrase, youth leadership is important because. And so while our panelists take a moment to think of that, um, I'd love to ask uh, someone from the United for Global Mental Health team to please add that into the chat because we'd love to hear from you too. Uh, if you'd finish the phrase, um, please include it into the chat. Youth leadership is important because, and so we're, we're, I'm, I'm going to kick it off to, uh, to Chelsea and Chelsea, lightning round, finish the sentence, pass it off to, um, to one of your fellow panelists. Thank you very much. Uh, I'll say um, I think youth leadership and engagement is important uh, because leadership demands inclusion. Inclusion really begats empowerment and empowerment inspires change. And we, the youth, have the solutions. We just need to be heard. Um, I'll pass it on to Ashley. Thanks, Chelsea. I don't know how I can add on from that on, but uh, for me, youth um, leadership uh, means and represents that of empowerment and full transparency and accountability when it comes to decision making. And I think too, Hawa had mentioned this earlier when it comes to transparency on the um, on documents and languages and between us as young persons with those folks who are older. So I'll pass it on to Viti. Thank you, Ashley. Uh, I, I guess my statement would be youth, youth leadership is super important because youth themselves are the experts with lived experiences. It's about time that we change this narrative where youth could only be included, you know, in those very tokenistic 
initial co like consultations. It's about time that we give you the, like the rightful space for leadership at the forefront of the global mental health movement. And I'm gonna pass it on to Howie. Thank you. Uh, mine is really, really short. Um, youth leadership is important because it is inevitable, pretty much. We can argue it, we can debate it, we can go back and forth on it, but it's going to happen everywhere. So it's either we get on board with it and make it deliberate, or it happens without our liking. Um, I do believe that uh, the world has moved far past the idea that you know young people do not have a say. Um, and I know that it's it's slow in catching up in certain areas of the world, but it is inevitable. It will catch up. Um, young people will not sit back forever and allow you know those who are perhaps even the minority to dictate what the rest of their lives would look like, um, or what matters to them, or you know what solutions look like for them. And so I do believe that irrespective of how much we like it or not, how much we debate it, leadership is important because it's inevitable. Yeah, okay. And Giyash, would you like to oh, would you like to yeah. help round us out? Yeah, um for me, youth leadership um basically i think everybody has delivered the best um <laughs> words uh, <laughs> I'm running out of words here but anyway i think youth leadership is uh uh basically uh, not a one size fits all again i would like to reiterate that because sometimes we have several methods documents surveys research but it's you know it's not always applicable to especially to global south low middle income countries uh, with maybe authoritarian government, with those in still the working class struggling to make ends meet in the sandwich generation, overworked, underpaid. So youth leadership should be fairly compensated, built on compassion, and uh, basically uh, trying to do better than what how we did yesterday, care for the care workers. Yeah, so full of solidarity, uh, uh, strength in collective, but respectful respectful of individuals. That's from Sorry, not really wrapping up, but yeah, hope that, no, that's the it's job. okay. It's okay. I, each of you touched on words and themes that were part of this discussion and incredibly important to uplift, especially as we round out this conversation. And before I jump into just rounding it out and thanking everyone for joining us, I'd love for each of our panelists to enter a link or a way in which anyone who's joining right now can can follow your work, can learn more open up the tab and then uh, check it out later on when you've got some time. So please feel free to add that. And in the meantime, thank you. Thank you to our panelists. Thank you to everyone who's joined us for this conversation and has participated in the conversation and seen your remarks through the chat. And we are so grateful for your active participation. Please remember that the next webinar will be on faith and religion. And the registration link is in the chat or will be sent to you. And also I'd love to share that We'll be continuing the conversation on Circle and that the link will also be included in the chat. Once again, thank you all for your time. Thank you all for uh, your treasure and your talent and the way in which you choose to spend your time with us today. Um, it is a choice and we are grateful that, um, that you have joined us. Uh, wishing you all a lovely rest of the day, afternoon or evening. Thank you and take care. Bye-bye everyone. Bye everyone. Thanks. Thank you, everyone.